I was doing Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper. We're in New Orleans, and it sounded very, very, it sounded like a wonderful, basic American movie, American, almost a Western. And you were going to uh, see America, but they saw, and, and think of the times when Kennedy was shot, Martin Luther King was shot, uh, all this violence was there, uh, uh, the, the, the Kent State, these students were shot. It was a very bleak period in American history, and, and they were portraying, and we were just getting uh, integration, and there was a lot of violence involved there. So they saw an America that was full of violence, not the Norman Rockwell smiling people of America. And they really were basing their movie technique on the, the it was called Cahier de Cinema, you know, the, the sort of naturalistic street movies that were done by the Italians. And uh, they, they, they weren't trying to be wild, they were movie makers. They were making a movie and they, they were trying to cast real people in various scenes. I mean, the, there was absolutely no money in it, but it was, it was very interesting. Getting involved with Easy Rider was uh, not in the usual way. I uh, was going to California to do uh, a story and my friend Terry Southern, the wonderful writer who did Blue Movie and, and many other, a lot of scripts, he called Dennis, so you have to go see Dennis. I know how interested you are in art. He's got this fantastic collection of pop art and you ought to see it. So he called Dennis, it was arranged. I, I got to California, I called up. He said, oh, come right over. I went right over, drove over, drove into his driveway and he was walking towards me. And he says, I've just been thrown out of the house. I can't show you the collection now. Let's go down and, and we have an off. Peter and I have an office. Uh, he said, "Well, we we'll go. Da- we'll go down and see, see Peter. He's trying to, get a script together." So we got in the car and went down. Bert Schneider was all set to give us some money, but he needed he needed a storyboard or a story like just anything that just basically tells a story. And they were having trouble putting it together, and they were. Uh, uh, uneasy about it, they were insecure. So uh, I said, well, well, what exactly is a story? I, I can't quite remember, I know Terry's been working on it, but what, what, tell me the story. So they started to tell me, very quietly and in a relaxed way. I said, hey, have you got a tape recorder? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, well, let's put it on, let's see what happens. So they started telling me the story and I uh, would keep them on track. We got it done quite quickly, and uh, we s- decided to play the tape back, and it sounded terrific. Peter did most of the talking, and he, he did it well. And uh, they said, oh, but now where? It's now 9 o'clock at night. Where are we going to find a typist, somebody to type? I said, forget it. Just take the tape over to your, your producer and let him listen to it and, 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 and see if you don't get the money. Dennis went off with it. He came back with a check. And we all went to Brown Derby and celebrated. <laughs> Dennis had promised Peter that he would respect his privacy and not ever ask him to explain or talk about his mother's suicide. And yet the very first bit of shooting that he did the very first day in New Orleans, he put Peter up in the arms of a statue of an angel in the cemetery and then fed him some lines and said, now tell her, tell the angel about your mother. And Peter began to comply and cry and do it. He responded. And it really was quite brilliant, and it became a, an incredible scene. And it was from the heart. And as a matter of fact, when I relooked at Easy Rider and saw Peter, he was a star in that picture. There were just such amazing performances by him, and this was one of them. However, that day, when he came down from that, I have pictures of this. Dennis is looking triumphant. He had just achieved this great moment of cinematography. And Peter feels betrayed and hurt and saddened. And he just looks so crestfallen. 
And then he takes the hand of uh, one of the women in the pictures and, and they go off and he needs to be comforted and soothed for this betrayal. And it's interesting because he described this in, in an autobiography and I have the pictures. But uh, it, it was successful doing that, that not unscripted uh, scene was extremely successful. Leo Lass had two brilliant charismatic stars, uh, Marcello Mastriani and Billy Whitelaw. And I heard about it um, at a party in London. I was talking to some friends, Bob Chardoff, who was the producer of it, his wife, Phyllis Rayfield. And I heard that they were gonna be shooting some incredible orgy scenes for John Borman the following day. So I asked the producer, I thought, boy, I, I was now working for uh, Vogue and, and the Weekend Telegraph. Uh, and I thought this would be very interesting for them. And so I, I asked them if I could come on set and do something for, uh, for possible use in these magazines when they were ready to release the film. And they said, sure, fine. And since I had attached connections still with all of my American publishers, they thought, well, this would be wonderful. So I was welcomed onto the set and they were beginning the swim scene, the, 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 the naked swimming pool scene. I moved upstairs to where the camera was shooting from, down on it, which was a good view. And again, I was welcomed, given a place to stand where I could freely uh, get what I needed without worry about by, by the sound of the camera. And I uh, looked down on the scene, got ready, and they all said, ready? And then Mastriani turned to me and said, oh, pretty photographer. <laughs> What are you doing up there, fully clothed? Take off your clothes and come and join us. <laughs> so I was very flattered, uh, delighted to be flirted with by Bastriani. And, uh, but the, the camera said, let's go. They started the movie and I started the, the photographs. Uh, and it was a very interesting work that day. They did both. Uh, I, I don't know if it was on one day or two days, but, but both scenes had this lighting which made things look almost uh, deadly, like, like people have been drained of color, as if it, it, it somehow implied a certain death or decadence that, that was, very, uh, uh, was very surprising. I'm sure that this was a, a, a John Borman touch he deals so much with life and death. And here was this uh, supposedly happy circumstance of people getting undressed and going to have this an orgy. And yet it had a feel of rot. When I arrive on set, I, I look around and try to figure out what's the story that will get into a magazine and be of interest to many people whether the picture is a great picture or not. And to me, the, the, the story was Monica Vitti. And so I concentrated on her, but I did it from a distance. She she's, was a, seemed a little nervous and touchy. And it was, so I took my long lens, which I love anyway, because I love the perspective that it creates. I like that flattened look where the background comes forward and, and uh, you often have blurriness in the background. You can focus on, on the star. And I took pictures of her, of her really between shots or during setups when she was just not on camera. And she was wonderful talking to other people. She was very expressive waiting for her her moment to begin. She had a sense of presence, but maybe a little fear. Uh, there was great expression in her face. In any event, I, I hadn't gotten near her or even had an introduction yet, 
But I did send over a sheet of pictures to say uh, which ones does she like. And next I'm called into her dressing room and she tells me that she's never seen better pictures of herself. She's really pleased. Would I like to do a special session with her? Oh my God, this was amazing. So I said, of course. And we arranged it and she did said, I'll do different costumes that are in the film and so on. She came out, we found a place to shoot. The pictures were not very, were dreadful. The pictures were boring. And the reason they were boring and posy is that Bonica Vitti is best when she's herself and not trying to be a model or not trying to even be, be the, the, the part she's playing in a movie. So it really is a director's job to get her to be herself first they had some very form-fitting costumes, but Monica Vitti, it turned out, was under a lot of pressure and tensions. Not only was she there and have to try to please her director, Joseph Losey, but back in her trailer every day, between scenes, she'd come back, and there was her lover, Michelangelo Antonioni, famous in his own right as a director, redirecting her. Then she'd go out, and Joseph Lowe would say, that isn't the way I wanted it. And then she'd go back. And the way she solved her or assuaged her problems was to eat. She also loved food and loved eating. And there's a line in the picture, oh, I just love food. And it, that she looked great on because it was a natural line. And she did, and she began to expand. And they began to change the costumes into these free-flowing or, or loose-fitting Things. You'll see in one of the pictures of the costume that it doesn't go in at the waist. It's sort of a, one of those bag dresses. So anyway, that became a problem. And since so much of this picture re related to its, its imagery, its appearance, its costume and set, uh, this became a problem. But quickly, the, 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 the wardrobe department and the art department, there was a wonderful art director, Jack Champan, that they solved it by simply totally changing the costumes as we went along. I was doing a story about collaborators, either pairs, marriages, partners, collaborators. What could be better than the collaboration of Billy Wilder and IAL Diamond, who had worked so successfully together on some of the greatest Hollywood comedies? Uh, I went over to the Baker Street set getting permission to do it and so on in order to photograph them together well they they always had a kind of i would say uh two foot distance between them they were not pe people i could seem to get into close to you know physically close together but mentally they were extremely close together and worked together for all those years and uh, uh, so I, I, I watched the set for a while and, 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 and tried to get them to, but they, Diamond is a very shy man. I, I think he expresses himself in his, in his creation of, of uh, dialogue. And, and, and while the film's dialogue is always very snappy. So it, it's a special art and he, he, he's a master of it and Billy Wilder. The, somehow the synergy between them worked and they, they got these, these brilliant films with this, this quickness and sharpness to them.